Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Williams, and you are listening or perhaps watching to another episode of Retail Redeveloped. I'm so lucky, so blessed today to get to talk about one of my favorite subjects on the planet, and that is the future of Charlotte, North Carolina. Most of you guys probably don't know, I'm born and raised in North Carolina. I've worked here my entire career. Um, I can't say enough about how much I love the city. And I'm being joined by right, right now by Taiwo Jayobi. And he is the Assistant City Manager and Director of Planning, Design, and Development with my very own City of Charlotte. Now, he is also a part of the city's executive leadership team, provides support to planning, transportation, Charlotte Area Transit Services Departments. And the hot topic right now is he currently oversees the city's rewrite of a 20-year comprehensive plan, the first since before I was born also known as Charlotte 2040 plan and the city's development code. Now, uh, it's, it's great. Tywo, you just released this thing to the wild and everybody was like, perfect, let's sign it. There was, there was no feedback, no, no changes that anybody wanted to make. It was, just, it was just easy breezy, right? Wouldn't that have been great, Adam, if that was the case? <laughs> but so, then it would not have been the best plan if there was no feedback. Well, I, uh, that's I, that's such a positive way to look at it, Taiwo. See, see, you are you are very well suited for your job, and I would be the absolute worst at your job. So, so before we jump into this plan, do me a favor. Tell everybody a little bit about who you are, okay. how you got to sit in the seat that you're sitting in now, which is one of the most important seats in the entire city, and just about the background, the passion, like what gets you up and excited in the day to come and do a really hard and sometimes thankless job. Thank you, Adam. First of all, thank you for inviting me to your show. I'm happy to be here. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about this very important subject about our future. So I grew up in Nigeria, it's where I was born and raised, um, West Africa. And then after I graduated for my master's program uh, degree in planning, I moved to Botswana, uh, which is that country north of South Africa, right after uh, Nelson Mandela was actually released from prison. Um, so I worked there for four years as a planner, worked on a number of uh, large scale plans and small, uh, small scale plans. I actually worked with a Swedish uh, company, which really is called Sweet Plan. They're responsible for planning and building in the country of Sweden. Um, so I left Nigeria in 1996 and uh, moved to Sacramento, California, uh, where I lived for about 13 years before I lived in Michigan and then subsequently in Georgia. And the company in 2015 transferred me to Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, and then in 2018, I had the opportunity to be in this position as the city's planning director. So it's been, uh, it's been a ride from Nigeria to Botswana, Southern Africa, to California, Michigan, Georgia, and here. You know, but isn't that part of what makes Charlotte so fun? I mean, Charlotte is, yeah, the, the Charlotte that I grew up in was a sleepy little southern town that, you know, a couple massive bankers decided to make into a real city. And now it's a melting pot. It's unbelievable. It, it has so many qualities that I just could have never foreseen growing up in, in Matthews, Mint Hill area of Charlotte, North Carolina. I, I can't, I couldn't even imagine living here 30 years later, much less this being this melting pot where, where we can really kind of all come together and make this city better. So I mean, looking, looking at your resume, Taiwo, you are, I already said all the, all the early stuff. You're also a board member of Charlotte Center City Partners, which if, if people don't know what that is, Google it, unbelievable resource, mm -hmm. unbelievable leadership when it comes to uh, uptown, uh, South End, uh, now obviously University City Partners as well. You're also uh, involved with Habitat for Humanity of Charlotte. You know how do you how do you keep all this straight, and how do you how do you manage to give so much of your time to these causes? Do you do you not sleep? What, what's your what's your secret? First of all, I drink a lot of coffee, but no, amen, amen. <laughs> but I, I do drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> but the right answer to that, frankly, is that I have a great team, uh, not just the team within the planning department. In my role, I also provide leadership support to the Charlotte Department of Transportation and the Charlotte Area Transit System. So that's our transit and transportation group. 
And within planning, got a great team within uh, Charlotte Department of Transportation and CATS, also got great teams, but also on this level as an assistant city manager, supported by a wonderful boss, the city manager, and my colleagues as assistant city um, managers as well. There are three of us. This work would be impossible, literally, without that team. But I also believe that what makes it a little bit easier for this work is that all those organizations that you've mentioned, they've got some traditions in place, uh, which really makes it also easy to get in there, understand what people have been doing for time for a while, but they also have those who are very innovative minded that I work with. And when you work with like-minded people, the task is a little bit easier, even if it's daunting, um, you know? And so that's really in addition to my coffee, how I'm able to coffee addiction, <laughs> I'm able to actually function in this role. Well, let's, so let's jump into the hard work. Uh, that, was, that was a perfect segue. Obviously a big part of why we're here is to give audience and give a little bit of a pulpit to the 2040 vision plan. Mm -hmm. uh, walk me before we get into the nuts and bolts. And before we get into the, you know, he said, she said the, the best parts, the worst parts, everybody has an opinion in your words. Yes. Tell me what is this plan? And why is it so important for a city like Charlotte? First of all, the comprehensive plan is a physical plan. It really talks about our physical growth over 10, 15, 20 years. There are some cities that even go beyond 20 years. For example, Chicago had a 2050 uh, comprehensive plan. And it's very important to have that, especially when you're a fast growing city and you're developing so fast. If you don't have a plan, you can't connect the dots. While it's truly a land use plan, it connects everything else, whether it's a tree canopy, or mobility plans, or uh, energy action plan, or jobs creation, or affordable housing. It really connects with us about where people work, where they live, where they play. We are the 15th largest city in the country by population. And last US census uh, estimates says that we are one of the top five fastest growing cities in the country. And so if we don't have a plan, then we don't have an idea how we plan for that future. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, talking about almost 400,000 people are gonna be added to our population today. Some are gonna be born here, but the fact is that some are gonna move here from other places. They are likely not going to come with their homes, if, if, unless it's a tiny house that they're driving with them. They're not gonna bring their asphalt with them. And I don't believe they're gonna bring their buses and trains with them, right? And they're gonna bring their trees with them either. So how do we plan for that type of future? A lot of people leave those communities like New York or Boston or LA or Chicago or Seattle. They left those places probably because of transportation issues. But when they come here, they still have a desire for some of the things they left behind, such as shops, retail facilities, dining, areas where they could go and play. We have to plan for that type of future. Last time we did something like this was 1975. We've had multiple plans since then. We had one in 1985. We've had you know, a lot of plans between that time and now, but nothing citywide and comprehensive like this. And so because we haven't had it in a while and we're just having it for the first time in a long time, there's a lot of people who have no idea what it is this is about. It's primarily a land use plan that addresses the issue of growth and development and how we plan for that future where we can continue to be a vibrant, thriving, growing city. So, that, so let's talk about the plan. Uh, if you had to pick your most important takeaways or the most important goals, uh, I, I know that there are 10 major goals and priorities. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we're, we're going to be limited by the amount of time here. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you've, you've put blood, sweat, and tears, a lot of, a lot of coffee beans in, into this plan. You know, walk me through, if you could just really boil it down, what are some of the most important parts that you want people to take away from this plan? Obviously, there's plenty of things that need to get tweaked, yes. plenty of things that we're not going to agree on. Yeah. Uh, but, but walk me through some of your, some of your babies. 
So I really believe that a, a plan for it to be successful like this is, has to be treated as a system. So identifying one issue is often very difficult. But when we think about our most problematic area in Charlotte right now, guess what that is? Housing. Whether it's housing for low-income people or for workforce, uh, we are creating jobs in this city. We continue to be an attractive place. Jobs are coming in, but people need to be able to live somewhere in the city. I believe that that's about all the 10 goals and they are connected. Housing access for all is probably the most important part of this. And that's goal number three. How do we make sure that everyone who walks and lives in the city has a place they can actually lay their heads tonight and it's affordable to them, uh, whether they own it or they rent it. Preferably home ownership, right? Because it's the pathway to wealth, uh, for, especially for our black and brown communities. So I believe that that goal on housing, I think it's goals number two and three that deal with housing in the comprehensive plan. That's so important, 34,000 units um, in terms of gap of affordable housing units. And the, the farther we go, and the faster we grow, the more challenging it will be to meet that goal if we don't do something about it today. So a couple questions on that. And, and yes. I, I don't want to spend the whole podcast on that because I know there's a lot of other important things to talk about. But to your point, you know, hard to grow a city when people can't live there. Yeah. Um, you know, how I'm always doing this dance of public versus private, right? Mm -hmm. You know, capitalist real estate guy. Right. That, that's just that's 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 who I am. How do you. I, I've heard it said by really smart developers that it's hard to build a used car. Right. Mm -hmm. Like like it's hard for me to build really affordable units in a free market because, oh, lumber futures are up 300 mm -hmm. percent. The land is what it is. I mean, I've got to I've got to pay the same amount of land. So so how can the city. Uh, I don't want to say enforce because I, I know that this isn't an, an enforcement kind mm -hmm. of Gestapo-ish, you know, type type of system. But how can you incentivize? How can you ensure? How can you let the private market, well, a guy like me, mm -hmm. make sense of building affordable housing and putting that on the forefront so it's not some kind of uh, charity case? Like it, it actually makes dollars and cents to do workforce low income. Like like how can the city shepherd that? You're very right, Adam. So I've always viewed a planner's role as being one of a facilitator mm -hmm. that really connects or bridges that gap or at least facilitates that conversation between those who build our city, that's the developers, those in the real estate industry, whether they be commercial developers or they be residential developers, facilitating a conversation between them and those who are the end users of the products, the community. And in addition to that, I always believe that a planner is not doing his or her job unless you are a custodian of public interest. And part of that public interest, obviously, is what exactly does the community want? And secondly, protecting our financial ability so that we can continue to be resilient as a city. There are things we can do today to help developers be able to generate affordable housing units, especially when we live in a state where we do not have mandatory inclusionary housing tool uh, to use, we can incentivize, we can expedite the rezoning process, we can expedite the permitting process. Maybe there are areas where if you're committing to a number of affordable housing units, we can actually um, reimburse you some fees that, that, will, that will incentivize you to do that. We don't need this plan to make that happen. What this plan does though, it has certain policies in place that can encourage home ownership. For example, we say minimum of 10% of our housing trust fund goes towards home ownership in vulnerable communities. That will incentivize some developers to really want to get into that and say, hey, if I wanna build in the Crescent where we have most minority population uh, live, while they are not asking me to do it, I can be incentivized by this 10% of housing trust fund, which is about $50 million, right? 10% of that would be 5 million. I can be encouraged to actually build homes for sale or townhomes for sale in this particular community. It's a partnership. The private community can't do it alone. We've got to work alongside them. And that's why some of the policies in this plan actually 
is really more facilitating that conversation, not saying that, you know, you have to do it because you really can't make people do it. But here are ways by which we can partner together for you to do what you need to do. The conversation reminds me a little bit of the Opportunity Zone conversations. Uh, I mean, obviously, that was a massive incentive for yes. developers to, to build in areas that, that they wouldn't normally look at. So uh, obviously, you know, federal tax credits are a lot different than anything that the city could do. Mm -hmm. But but still, it sounds like you guys are trying to think in, in similar terms, like, like, how do we make it, you know, a little bit more uh, plausible and attractive to, to, to offer these types of services in these areas? Yes, I, we are. Because the more you incentivize and encourage, whether it's by providing, um, you know, flexibility and regulatory tools and, and or you're providing options. Uh, and if the developer knows I can build this for less than $200,000 per unit, if, if you save me some money on the public end of things that will allow me to build that, it also allows me to be able to sell it in an affordable manner. Um, at this, there are certain impacts on the community also. It's not necessarily all financial. Sometimes the community can say, hey, we would like you to help us um, you know, contribute some things towards traffic signal, um, signaling so that the traffic trees that your development generates, we can actually mitigate that uh, impact on us. So it will be a conversation between community and the developer. Um, but I really truly believe that we as a public entity have a major role to play in incentivizing our developers to be able to do what they do best, because that's not what we do, but we can set those policies right. in place. So, so let, let's switch from housing. I mean, absolutely heard, well said, uh, and and couldn't agree more that that's something that that we that we have to that we have to think about. Yes, uh, and and has to be in the forefront. What other goals? Uh, if if you had to pick one to to slot in under housing, mm -hmm. uh, what what would be another big goal that that you feel really passionate about? It would be mobility. So the the, the first goal talks about creating ten minute neighborhoods. But then the fourth and the fifth goals talk about trails and transit-oriented development and safe and equitable mobility. So you have three different goals that approach mobility in, from different angles. If you're gonna drive, then let's drive in a safe and equitable manner, right? In a safe and smart manner. Let's balance mobility because the average household in Charlotte today spends about 23% of their income on transportation. If you were to provide options for those families, 43% um, of people who live in the Crescent spend about that amount. And think about the fact that the median income of people who live in the Crescent is roughly $49,000. And if they spend 43%, if 43% of the population that live in the Crescent spend 23% of that amount on transportation, that's huge. I believe that not only is it important to make housing affordable, we also have to provide options for transportation. Because if the transportation burden is less, then you give people more disposable income to spend on housing, to spend on groceries. And if they have student loan debt, which we often don't think about, you know, it can help in that area as well. We need to invest more in bus services, bus transit services, we need to invest more in fast, frequent, reliable transit services that could be a lifeline for a lot of people who are struggling maintaining the vehicles they have today to go from job to home, from home to visit friends and all of that. So making savings on transportation will be very important. And the reason we commit about three different goals, uh, approaching mobility from different angles. Um, you keep mentioning the Crescent. Explain to people what you mean by the Crescent. So the Crescent is that area north of Uptown Charlotte, goes to the west and then to the east of Charlotte, uh, to the east of Uptown. And that's really where you have the most minority population. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where you have most black and white population, black and brown population, and where you also have low income folks, as well as um, a lot of immigrants. Uh, you've got a lot of um, mom and pop, uh, pop and mom, um, you know, stores in those yeah. areas. Um, you've got a lot of uh, smaller dining, um, right. you know, restaurants in those areas. That's where you have the lowest life expectancy in the city. It's also where you have um, the highest disparity in terms of investment. 
uh, when you compare it to the wedge, which is predominantly South Shallow. Yeah, we, we talk about, I always call it the funnel instead of the wedge when I'm describing it to people, but I 100% understand what you're saying. Uh, so mobility, uh, those are staggering numbers when you think about percentage of incomes. Mm -hmm. So obviously, tr how do we fix transportation or how do we continue to grow transportation? Obviously, it's very hard to look at Charlotte and, and project out our population without bringing Atlanta up. Mm -hmm. like it's just it's our, it's our kind of Southeastern rough draft of a, of a major Metro. Uh, yeah. you know, how can we look at that, learn from that, the knock on, you know, Dallas and Houston and Atlanta, the cities that are certainly that, that, that grew really quickly and then that weren't kind of the original metropolitan areas. Uh, it's always, the knock is always obviously uh, cost of living, but not, not, not as much in Dallas, Houston and, and Atlanta, that's more the kind of major metros, but it's sprawl. Yes. Right? It's like, how do we, how do we make our city livable in an intelligently planned manner? And obviously we're, um, you know, some city leaders had a lot of foresight and pushed the light rail through when everybody was, everybody was a, not in my backyard kind of against yeah. it. And you can see that it's created the most dynamic neighborhood in between, you know, DC and Atlanta, mm -hmm. obviously uh, connecting UNCC to uptown. Don't understand how that could be seen as a bad idea, but obviously people didn't like it at, at the time. How do we continue to keep that conversation on the forefront? Cause these aren't small decisions. These aren't small ideas. These are, mm -hmm multi-billion dollar decade long projects that in my mind need to to continue if we're going to make charlotte a truly special city um, i'd love to hear your take on on sprawl and on on how we stay ahead of this because you can only make the streets so wide right mm -hmm. if you're talking about adding four hundred thousand people most of them aren't going to live right outside of uptown right that it's very hard to get there so how, how do we continue to stay ahead of this Absolutely, and timing is essential. Um, we always, you know, when something feels like it looks like it's expensive, we tend to punt it right. uh, into the future. We forget, and people in your business know this very well, that every single day you delay implementation of something, there's an added cost to it. Costs don't go down, they go up. Uh, and so every time we talk about, let's invest in, in rail or let's invest in rail transit or let's invest in you know a robust trail system and people quickly say it's going to cost a whole lot the question is if we don't do it now how much is it going to cost two years from now five years from now ten years from now and another set of policy makers come up and they say the same thing that's where leadership is very important to say if we don't take action now we are going to get to a point where it's going to be very difficult for us to do. Atlanta did not become Atlanta overnight. I mean, the fact is that Atlanta has about 1.5% of its sales tax dedicated to public transit alone. We have 0.5% of our sales tax, and we've had that since 1998. And despite the 1.5% Atlanta dedicates towards transit, they still have traffic issues compared to us. So that tells you that if we keep our 0.5% the way it is, and we're not making investments that are transformational in public transportation, it will be very hard for us to not become Atlanta. And I'll tell you, this is how I tell the story. It may even be worse for us because the city of Atlanta has a smaller population versus the city of Charlotte. It's the counties around Atlanta that make up the bulk of the region's population. Atlanta's population rarely cracks 500,000 as a city. But when you think of Gwinnett and Cobb and Fulton, it goes to about 5.7 million people. Charlotte as a city is almost 900,000 people. In another 20 years, that population goes to 1.2 million. And so these are people who live in the city not necessarily work in the city. So transportation will only get worse if there is no you know, associated robust investment in transit as we build more and more. And then people will begin to funnel into the suburb. And that's very important for us to keep in mind. 
Um, you know, so we need to have that investment. I always say that, you know, we need to have a sense of urgency about it. So how do we keep, I mean, obviously that that's an extremely good point about the city of, of Charlotte versus the city of Atlanta, their counties versus our counties. It's almost mirror, mirror images because Mecklenburg, the big joke in North Carolina is the great state of Mecklenburg, right? Mm -hmm. Mecklenburg is bigger than most of the other counties combined. Yeah. When you look at uh, population, when you look at like income, when you look at everything, right? We have the airport, we have blah, blah, blah. Uh, so which is better, right? Do you, is it better to have all these strong counties that have their agendas and can invest and make their counties strong? Or is it, and not have to deal with one major county that's got to figure out a thousand really complex problems at once? Wh which is the better scenario? So at the end of the day, we can't control, right, or legislate where people live in terms of where they choose to live. So people can go and live in Hyredale County or they live in Cabarrus or they live in mm -hmm. Union. It all depends on what people are looking for. Schools, for example, a place of safety. Ooh, it's a hot button right now. I don't oh, know if we should go there. Huge, huge. <laughs> I don't huge. know if we should go there right now. <laughs> you know, so, so, well, let's keep this. Let's, let's, let's not. <laughs> we don't have enough time. Time. So, I got my so wife's that, out here. That's a major driver. And right now, I think that we're doing well with regards to the composition. The key thing for us is how do we work well together? Mm -hmm. If we work well together, then it doesn't matter whether Mecklenburg is bigger than Iredell or Cabarrus, if we work well together. All right. So I'm going to, I got to keep this thing going because we've got a hard cutoff and I have about a thousand questions I want to ask you. Sure. What has been, what has been the biggest surprise, the biggest pushback? something that that you released and you were like this makes a lot of sense and everybody just was ready to get out the pitchforks and the torches and and uh and just kick you out of town like what what has been the uh, the hot button that that has surprised you or just the hot button in general i think it's a single family um uh, zoning thing in terms walk, of walk us walk us through that it, walk us through what what it says what the point was and then what you think people are taking issue about. So Charlotte has one of the largest land areas in the country zoned for single family, exclusively for single family. And that's one of the reasons why housing cost is high uh, compared to a number of cities of our size. So we came out and looked at, did some analysis and felt one of the ways to actually uh, mitigate that is to allow housing diversity on single family lots. You can still build single family homes. We cannot stop people from building that. You're still gonna have single family zoning, but can you allow, can we allow duplexes, triplexes to be built on those single family lots and then allow uh, quadruplexes, quadruplexes to be built along arterials? Um, yeah, I, I assume that, you know, from everything we've seen, from what we know, and we've been saying it for two years, that that's one that our community will really gladly embrace. Um, while there's still a strong um, section of the community that are okay with that, there are three issues that are continue to come up. What will allowing a duplex near my single family home do to my property value? That's a very legitimate concern. Number two, if you do this, what about areas where land is cheap? Um, you know, will, you, will that not result in gentrification and subsequently displacement? And number three, what's the impact on, dense, on, on traffic? Um, you know, and those are things that the comprehensive plan has policies around, but we need to strengthen those policies to say, number one, allowing housing diversity does not destroy property values. There is no evidence for it. It's it, it just not there. And we've looked over and over, it's not there. Number two, can it result in displacement? It's happening now. Even if right. there was no housing diversity, displacement is happening now. Right. And number three, does it result in traffic, higher traffic trips? Actually, it's contrary. Single family housing generates more traffic than compact development. But we just need to be able to message those out and, and address them so that people understand that embracing this does not necessarily mean you're losing something, but you're actually gaining more. Is there a way, so one of the most genius things about the light rail, but people didn't understand that it was like a, a tax basis Trojan horse, right? It's like, <laughs> we build the light rail, we turn a very low density I2 property into a 300 unit 
mm -hmm. uh, multifamily development. Oh, and by the way, they can walk to their transportation to get to the major hub. Mm -hmm. It's not that complicated. That's what the light rail is about, guys. Yeah. If you don't, like, and Tywo, you don't even have to agree with me. I don't know if that's a, a hot button issue, but that's why the light rail was built. So if it makes sense to me, if maybe instead of a blanket zoning that just handles all of, of single family, maybe if there's ways to, to weight it more heavily towards arteries and areas that are already primed for growth, um, maybe, that would, maybe that would be one way to just kind of make it a little bit more targeted, but I don't know if it achieves the goal. That yeah, I mean, th th that's, a good, that's a very good argument, obviously. But then the counter argument to that is that if you concentrate it in one area, we're going to create the very problem we're trying to solve. So if you can look at look at one of the problems, or at least one of the criticisms of light rail is that it has resulted in displacement of people who used to live there Fact. in those areas. Exactly. So imagine now saying we're going to just concentrate this along some of those arterials. We right. end up increasing cost of land and cost of housing, and you end up displacing people. So hence the reason why concentrating it in one area I mean, may end up creating the very problem that we're trying to resolve. However, having said that, policy 2.2 actually speaks to that, that when we will have some of these units, we can also have them on materials in addition to having them in, in, on single family lots across the city. If you have it blanket like that, it's not gonna happen overnight. It's just gonna provide the opportunity that when the time comes, um, you have the ability to be able to build different types of housing products. I, I think that's such an interesting, I could sit here for an hour and we could talk about the pros. I know. Process. I would like totally nerd out about it, but we've got to keep moving. Clock's ticking. Uh, yes. Walk me through place type versus zoning district. And, and yeah. let, me, let me explain why that matters to me. So I have to do this constant dance with the city where I buy something. So I'm an urban guy, right? Like mm -hmm. I don't even know how to find wax on a map. No offense to everybody who lives in Waxhaw. I've heard it's lovely. I'm an urban Jeez. guy, right? Like, I, and I'm sure it's lovely. I, but yeah. I, my whole world is, in, is, is urban, right? Yeah. And I try to buy or I try to, to do something in an urban area. And I'm dealing with parking restrictions and codes that aren't, that are completely out of touch. They don't understand mm -hmm. scooters. They don't understand Uber. They don't understand the way the neighborhood has matured. So walk me through what place types versus zoning districts are mm -hmm. and walk me through how the city can stay in touch and not use these old arcane kind of laws that, that are, in my mind, constricting these areas that people have proven they want to eat, work, play, and they want to be dense. Mm -hmm. All of those things you just mentioned, they live in the zoning districts, the parking areas, how high, how tall your building should be. Those are specifications, those are details that live in the zoning districts. But before we get into the zoning districts, we have the place types. Place types are really more, they're data, data driven and it's a way to define and visualize aspects of land use, connecting it to transportation. So you're not just talking about an industrial use, you're talking about it in association within transportation interactions around it. And those place types, they provide a design intent, and the key word is intent. It, this is the intention. We want to design this area like this and for this purpose. And so you define some planning and you know, uh, design parameters around them. What's the mix of land uses? What does it look like? How do you put public spaces around them? What do they, it's more of a contextual planning, so to speak. It brings land use plan alive. You can visualize it and see what it looks like. Once you have that, they translate into the zoning district. So for example, a place that would say, you're gonna have 20, you're gonna have 20 floor uh, building in this particular place type, let's call it commercial. Then when you get into the zoning district, it specifies what that height will look like, what that mass will look like. How does it correlate with other uses around it? Because while the place type may visualize it with an intention to densify it, the district actually begins to call out the specific numbers that will make it possible. So we're having argument over the policy division that's in the place type, but a lot of that argument actually live with the details in the unified development ordinance, which is where you have all of the regulations and ordinances together 
Where do I park? How tall is the parking structure? What are the trees looking like around it? How does it correlate with other uses? How does it transition to uses adjacent to it? I saw John Kutbatsen's article, and a lot of what he said in there really relates to the UDO, the Unified Development Ordinance, not necessarily the place types. But a lot of people have that same um, you know, conversation, and I think it's our responsibility as planners to really help to define the distinctions between the two. Well, and it, and it makes me a little curious because we want these to be data driven, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's hard for the city to foresee booms, mm -hmm. right? Like it's impossible for, for you guys to be like, you know what? Freemore West is going to be the, the third hottest area in the city in yep. three years. Yep. Like the only guy that saw that coming was Matt Browder. <laughs> nobody else, <laughs> nobody else knew that was going to happen. So how do you guys kind of stay current and 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 kind of roll with it with those kind of changes or is yeah. this supposed to be a living breathing kind of document so with the comprehensive plan we did a fiscal impact analysis if council adopts it hopefully then we transition to mapping the, the place types along with retail experts residential experts and, and community members then when we get into the udo we're going to do economic impact analysis that will really help us to identify which parts of this place types do not really correspond to what the economy is telling us. So there's opportunity even to make changes to the place types after the council has adopted it. You know, and I know we're, we're now right at, at 12.45, but I'll tell you this, Pro, before we launch the comprehensive plan, we do what we call a demand allocation analysis uh, for a 20, 25 year period, 2020 to 2045. And it shows us, we looked at office, retail and residential. And it shows us, for example, for retail, that experiential retail is the wave of the future. Millennials want to have experience. We're not building malls anymore. You know, if it's not experiential. It's it's on life support already. Exactly, it is, and that informed a lot of what went into our place types. Now, we're, that was before COVID, right? Now we're trying to tweak that study to take COVID nineteen impact into consideration. Um, so during place types mapping that will inform us as well. So while the place types principles may be adopted by council, the place types mapping will involve a lot of collaboration between the development industry and the resident and, and residents to really see what exactly is driving markets in certain parts of the city, like you said. Wonderful. Well, I know that, I know that we're up against the time. Taiwo, I just want to take a second and acknowledge you for coming on, sharing, I mean, I, I don't know how you I don't know how you keep all those balls in the air, all those plates spinning, but we're we're certainly ha happy to have you here trying to solve all of our problems uh, and trying to keep us ahead of the curve. As a parting shot, uh, tell people where they can go and get more information about uh, the plan, how they can connect, how they can kind of get involved, mm -hmm. and then give me one thing that would be a win for you based on this plan, if, even if it just gets the conversation started, gets the ball rolling, give, give me one win before we leave. So uh, cltfuture2040.com, cltfuture2040.com. That's the website. And my email address is easy, taiwo at charlottenc.gov, taiwo at charlottenc.gov for people to ask questions directly. I'm typically responsive uh, to that. I believe one win for us is let's grab, you know, kind of pull around what is the solution to upward mobility for us as a city. Um, housing is a major part of that. If what we're proposing in the comprehensive plan is not the way, I'd like to have some ideas as to what we believe can still move us in that direction, while at the same time helping us to resolve our upward mobility challenge. And if, if people have those ideas, I'm open-minded. We want to look at that and really work with them to see how can we do this and still be able to have some anti-displacement ideas in the comprehensive plan that will assure people that we're still trying to create a livable and viable city. Well said. Taiwo, again, thank you so much for joining us. It was an thank absolute you, pleasure. And uh, we need to do this again soon when we, when we can take another chunk out of this plan. Thank you so much, Adam, for having me on. I appreciate it. And nice to meet you. Awesome.